Living Off the Land with Pete Griffin, the Storytelling Ranger. I transferred to Alaska in 1992. It was a, uh, I was looking for a, a rung on a, on a career ladder because I, I wanted to be the guy in charge. And, and my wife understood that. We had a couple of young kids. And so I was looking at different places around the country where I could get a promotion and, and that would lead to another promotion and pretty soon I'd be the guy in charge. And one day I came home with two vacancy announcements, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Ketchikan, Alaska. And my wife gave me one of those looks. And she said, we are not moving to Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, what about Ketchikan? And she says, is there a hospital in Ketchikan? Well, yes, there is. I said, there's a, there's a hospital. There's uh, several middle schools, a couple of high schools. There are more churches than there are bars in Ketchikan. And so she said, well, okay, Ketchikan. That was in 1992. And for the first several years, my dream was getting back to northern Michigan, upper Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota to be the guy in charge in the Great Lakes states on one of the districts. But that didn't happen. But after a while, I realized that I didn't want to leave Alaska. It was the hunting, the fishing, the wildlife, the birds, the ocean, the mountains, the glaciers. It was, it was, it was a dream that I grew into. But one of the things I did after I got to Alaska is I started keeping track of people who moved to Alaska, not the ones that got transferred, hey, you know, had a job or anything, but it, what was fascinating to me was the people who moved to Alaska who didn't have a job lined up, and I, I kept track of the reasons. And the top three reasons, reason number three, is that uh, they were in the witness protection program. <laughs> The second most popular reason for moving to Alaska without a job lined up is that they're running from the law in the lower 48. And I can't tell you how often you read in the newspapers up there, so-and-so was stopped for a broken taillight, and oh, lo and behold, there was a warrant for the arrest in, in, in Omaha. And uh, it took them into, into, uh, into jail and transferred them out. But the main reason people moved to Alaska without having a job is that they had fallen in love with the idea of living off the land. Move to Alaska, live off the fat of the land. Well, there is more to it than that. <laughs> you know, it's, some folks dreamed of having a cabin in the woods. Uh, and uh, these folks were mostly unmarried. You might remember, uh, Christopher McCandless, in 1992, April of 1992, he was a young man kind of looking for himself, and he got rid of all his possessions, uh, emptied his bank account, and he moved to Alaska, uh, and he went into the wild with 10 pounds of rice, a case of 22 shells, and a rifle, and a desire to find himself. Well, in August of 1992, he died. Uh, it was either of starvation, or uh, a fungus had in, infested his supply of food, or he had dug up and eaten some poisonous roots. They, they never were really sure. And that's what happens when you do something like that. This was the uh, this 2006 movie by Sean Penn. And it's more than hunting and gathering and fishing and gathering berries. Living off the land is a tradition it's a, it's a culture, and it's a family thing, and, and poor Christopher McCandless did not have any of that support. He hadn't come from a tradition of living off the land. His, he didn't have any family there to tell him what berries were good to eat, and what, when it was time to fish, and when it was time to hunt. He didn't come from that culture. So I have some examples of the culture that I was raised in, in Upper Michigan, that prepared me for my future. In Juneau, not so many years ago, I was standing on my back porch, and I looked down, and I saw what I knew to be a snake berry. Now, a snake berry, when I was growing up, any berry that I saw out in the woods, uh, oh, hey, what, what's that berry? It looks like it's big and fat. Is that good to eat? And if the adult I was with didn't know what it was, it was a snake berry. 
And I wasn't supposed to eat it. I wasn't supposed to taste it. I wasn't even supposed to touch it because there was a kid over in some neighboring community, maybe Dafter or Raber or some place that I'd never been, who had eaten a bunch of snake berries and had to be taken to the hospital to have his stomach pumped. Now, I'd never been to a hospital, never had my stomach pumped, but it didn't sound like a, a pleasant thing. Well, I realized that snakeberry was kind of a generic term. So I, I looked this one up, and it turned out to be a twisted stock. There's another common name for this berry, and it's watermelon berry. And my book said it was good to eat. So I got down off the porch, and I picked one of these berries, I popped it in my mouth, bit down, and my mouth was flooded with the taste of watermelon. It was delicious. I had been missing out on this berry for 50 years. Now, now there is, there is, there, there are tribes in the interior of Alaska who do believe that the twisted stock berry, the watermelon berry, is poisonous, and they call it dead man's berry. And I can just picture uh, an elder walking with a, a grandson out along the banks of the Yukon River. Oh, grandfather, look at that berry. It's big and looks juicy. Is that good to eat? Oh, no. That's dead man's berry. A kid up in chicken <laughs> ate a bunch of dead man's berry and had to be airlifted to Fairbanks Hospital to have his stomach pumped. So, you know, we do pass on a lot of information from generation to generation. Now, some of it isn't always correct. But I never did die of eating snake berries. Now, the, uh, there is another name for it, too, called scoot berry. They call it scoot berry. Yeah, because if you eat too many of them, you don't want to get too far away from a bathroom. <laughs> now, of course, I told this story and, you know, kind of, kind of making fun of all the elders and the adults for calling it snake berries. But there is a real snake berry. It's bane berry. And snake berry is the name for it. And that is absolutely poisonous and it grows in Upper Michigan, it grows in Alaska. So one of the things about living off the land in, in, uh, in Alaska is fish. And Sweetheart Creek, uh, appropriately named because my daughter, uh, her first date was with a young man to Sweetheart Creek, where there's a run of sockeye salmon. You can see a falls there that the salmon can't get up over. So the sockeye salmon run up, and then they, they, they stack up below that falls. And this is the, uh, the barrier falls. Those, so those are sockeye salmon. Uh, they're not going to get any further than that. Now, because it's a good place for the fish to gather, it's a good place for the fishermen to gather, and it's a good place for the bears to gather. This is an Alaska brown bear. You can see some fishermen downstream, and their boat is, is right here. And that's, uh, I, I went to with my son-in-law uh, one day to fish for sockeyes, you know, hoping to get some bear pictures, and I got some bear pictures. Now this is, this is how we're doing it. This is a, these aren't sport fish. They are, they're fish that are, are meant for consumption. And this is my son-in-law, Jake, doing the honors. That's a nice mess of sockeye salmon there. So where Jake was throwing that net, it's in a cleft between the rocks. And that attracts attention. Now, this, this is a brown bear, but it's a, it's a young brown bear. And you can tell it's a young brown bear by the size of its ears. Its ears stick way out. It's got long, skinny legs. And, and young bears are like young people, like teenagers. They're kind of pushing the boundaries to see how far they can go. And this one was very, very curious about, about Jake and the fish he was catching. Now, I was fishing with Jake down in this, in this gully uh, when fishermen across on the other side of the creek started pointing at our side, and I knew what that meant. There was a bear that was patrolling our side 
of the of the stream and so I got my camera out and sure enough this brown bear pokes its head over the ledge uh, looking down at us and our catch of fish to see what he could do now these bears uh, will get fish that are unattended so the rule down there is you never leave your fish unattended and if a bear approaches you you do not drop your fish because that just teaches the bear that the closer I get the more nervous I'll make them and, and the sooner they'll drop those fish so eventually he looked directly at me and the uh, the expression on his face is just wonderful I was on the ship one day and and uh, I said, I wonder what's going through his mind. And this lady from Tennessee says, I know exactly what was going through his mind. Is that juice worth the squeeze? <laughs> <laughs> was it worth the trouble to, <laughs> to run us out and, and, and get our fish? It usually isn't. But the brown bears have learned at Sweetheart Creek that uh, we have to clean our fish in the creek. We're not allowed to clean the fish on the uh, uh, on the bank because you, you, the, the guts and the, and the, the stench uh, just is going to attract them. So we have to clean them in, in fresh water and dispose of the innards in the running water, which, you know, coming from the Midwest, I'm kind of going, gee, never do that around here. But the bears have learned that downstream of where you're doing all this, this uh, dressing of the fish and tossing the entrails in the water, the bottom is just littered with, with, with good food. So here's, this might even be the same bear I got the photo of. You can see he's picking up row and milk sacks off the bottom. And then in a couple of, couple of seconds here, we see why we tell people to make noise when they're on the streams. You don't want to take bears by surprise. If somebody was walking down the stream and that's where you run into problems with bears. Uh, they're, they don't want to attack you, but if you take them by the surprise, they're, they're going to they're gonna swat you. They're, they're going to do something to eliminate what they see as a threat. So when I got to Alaska, you know, I, I wanted to go deer hunting. They have Sitka black-tailed deer there. They're pretty small. And the best places to hunt are in some of the places where there are bears, brown bears in particular. Admiralty Island is just a, a, a three or four mile boat ride from Juneau. And so I, I wanted to hunt hunt deer and Joe told me a story now when you hunt deer in Michigan we have deer stands and you wait for the deer to come by uh, in Alaska it's a little bit different there are so few people out there in the woods you have to go to the deer you sneak sneak through the woods and wait to spot a deer well Joe told me a story Joe had been there uh, for a few years and he was hunting on Admiralty Island it he and his his uh, hunting companions had had, had uh, beached their boat, got off, and scattered out through the woods to, to go hunting deer. And Joe decided he was going to go up high, up the mountain, above the tree line, or at least into the, some of the uh, uh, terraces up above sea level where there were some bogs and kind of open, uh, scattered trees, because that was a good place to hunt deer. Well, he said he got a deer, and he was dragging the deer out. He dressed it, and he was dragging it out down back to the beach so they'd meet everybody uh, at the time that, uh, uh, at the appointed time, and they would go back to Juneau. One of the things the bears have learned on Admiralty Island is that when there's a rifle shot, there's probably going to be a deer, a dead deer, near where that rifle shot was. And, and those folks know that, so, so they're always very wary as they're dressing the deer and hauling them out. But Joe says he was dragging his deer across a muskeg and he heard something and he turned around and he said only 50 yards away there was a bear running at him full tilt. And these bears can run 30, 40 miles an hour. And Joe says the last thing, the last thought that went through his mind, oddly enough, before the bear hit him, was that most bears that prey on human beings are old and they have broken teeth. And he said that bear's teeth were perfect and wham! <laughs> down went Joe. And of course what he did is he played dead because that bear didn't want Joe. The bear wanted the deer. Joe was only a threat that he was going to drag the deer off. So, so Joe covers up with, you know, he curls into a fetal position and gets his, 
arms and, and hands across the back of his neck because those are the vital areas you don't want the bear biting. Well, the bear bit Joe several times, left him, and Joe, of course, is motionless, and the bear gets the deer and starts dragging it off. And Joe lays there about a half hour waiting for enough time to pass that he could get up and he could continue on his way down to the shore. Well, he had a radio. Now, this was before cell phones. He had a, a marine radio. Uh, it was in his pack that had been ripped off, and he started to crawl over to that to grab his radio, and the bear came back. And the bear bit him up, chewed on him again, and then stood on him, 600 pounds of bear, in a bog, standing on Joe until Joe absolutely stopped moving, and Joe was, he was in tough shape by then. And the bear left him again. Now, this time, Joe said he must have laid there for an hour. It's hard to tell. He, he didn't know. But by this time, it was starting to get dark. And finally, he knew that he had to have help. So he crawled the rest of the way with his backpack, got out the radio, called his friends who were on the beach, worried about him because it was, it was starting to get a little dark. And they were able to call Juno, call a, a helicopter, a med medevac, and they came and got Joe, took him to the hospital, and, and today Joe is just fine. But he tells that story, and I'll tell you what I learned from this. You don't hunt deer on Admiralty Island while the bears are still awake. You wait until they hibernate, which is sometime in November. But still, there are individual bears that don't follow the rules, and they may not hibernate until December. So. Hunting deer in a place like that where you're not the ultimate predator gives you a sense of life that you don't otherwise get when you're out in the woods. So I have had, oh man, the, the privilege of hunting in a lot of different places in, in the state of Alaska, I've seen some really amazing country. I've hunted up here in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and I just love this display. That's the, you know, I, I, I live down here in, in uh, northern Georgia, and I've hunted up here in, in central upper, upper peninsula, over here the Noatak Park and, uh, and National Preserve, somewhere in the Dakotas, and way out here in Adak and the Aleutians for caribou. It's a fantastic country. You hunt moose every year in the interior. There's just not enough, there isn't enough time in the world to see that whole place, but I've seen a lot of the corners of it. And in the interior, a lot of places are high and dry. Uh, north of, this is north of Fairbanks, these are gravel ridges. And then uh, along the rivers, it's low and wet. Uh, the Aleutian Islands, this is the uh, town of Adak on Adak Island. There's a, a naval air station there. Uh, during, the, during the war years and through the 80s and into the 90s. I think it was finally closed in the mid-90s. Uh, and it was, it was a town of 3,000 people, 5,000 people. Uh, and and it was, the base was closed, so there are only about 100 permanent residents in ADAC anymore out in the Aleutians. There's uh, somebody on a four-wheeler here that's, that uh, is heading into the, deeper into the island to, uh, to hunt caribou. Those caribou were planted back in uh, uh, the 1950s. In fact, I was standing in line to get on a Princess cruise ship when a, there was an old guy, an old couple behind me, and I said, hey, is this your first time to Alaska? And, and the, the lady said, no, but uh, it's, uh, it, it, Bill's been here before. He was stationed in Alaska. And Bill says, yeah. He said, when did Alaska become a state? I said, uh, 1959. He said, I was out in ADAC that year. And they flew us to Juneau because they were going to have a parade uh, on the day Alaska became a state. He says, because they didn't have enough people in town for the parade. <laughs> so they flew us into Juneau. We marched three blocks. And then we got on a bus, went to the airport, and flew back home. But he said, you know, he said, there was another project. He said, they got all us farm boys from Wisconsin and Michigan. It, they had a project. They, they had, they had a, a couple of dozen caribou calves that they wanted to be raised to be wild and to be released on the island for food or, and for, for, for hunting. And, uh, and that was the origin of the caribou herd on Adak Island, which I 
tell stories about Adak Island and hunting caribou on, on, uh, on that island, even, even today. It's a fantastic place. That's uh, on Adak, I think that's the Bay of a Thousand Islands. It's sunny, the wind's always blowing. Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, caribou crossing the river in the Noatak National Park and Preserve. And if it's, gosh, can you hunt in national parks? Well, you, no, you can't, but it's a national park and preserve. Uh, and so they were very careful in, in naming national parks and preserves in, in Alaska because these are places that people have subsisted for, for years. And that was our way into the No Attack National Park and Preserve. I was caught there after a rain and the water kept coming up and the landing strip was a gravel bar out in the middle of the river. And, and the later in the day it got, the higher the water got, everybody had gotten out except me and another guy. And this, this pilot, he had to land a little short in the water in order to, to make the landing splashdown. So this is one of the few slides that I have that's, well, it's not one of the few slides I have with numbers, but it's, it's uh, rural Alaskans consume on the average of 375 pounds of wild food every year. That's about 2,000 calories a day. And that's not the people like me in, living in Juneau or people in Anchorage or Fairbanks, but that's people in the rural villages, the, the villages of, of 100 people to, to 800 people. Most of that is fish, 60% is fish, which is 225 pounds. You saw that with, uh, uh, with the sockeye salmon. And this is, this is uh, uh, my son-in-law and a friend of his cleaning their sockeye salmon in the stream. And that's, uh, those are sockeye fillets. Those will be fresh frozen. They'll be smoked and frozen, um, canned or jarred, as they call it. Now, I had to include this. This is a young cousin of mine who had caught a 44-pound halibut on his first fishing trip to Alaska. I don't believe. Did you see it come right up to the boat? You grab it? No. I did. It about scared the. The sea lion, as we were pulling anchor, came up and grabbed the fish that was hanging from the side of our boat. And it's almost like he's taunting us, throwing that fish back and forth. And I wondered why it would do that. But the thing is, is that he can't hold it down to take a bite. That's the, uh, the remains. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, and, and he's tossing the fish because it's grabbing a chunk of the fish and shaking it to rip off a piece so it can swallow it. Because he can't hold it down with its paws. So uh, land mammals. 20% of that uh, 375 pound uh, moose, of course, is a big one. Uh, this is a, a number of moose packages. I had a, uh, we have a, a butcher in, in Fairbanks that will, will cut up and, and wrap our moose for us, uh, which is important, especially when it's warm. So we had moose roast, moose steak, and something called lion steak. And I didn't realize that until after we got home, after crossing the Canadian border, I thought, you know, if somebody asked, what are you doing with lion meat? I, you know, I'd be kind of speechless, but I realized, realized that our butcher was probably better at living off the land than he was at spelling bees, because that's loin steak. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, doll sheep are an important part of the uh, of subsistence uh, in, in, uh, in Alaska. This was a doll sheep. My friend and I were hunting doll sheep in, up in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and we saw some sheep over the brow of a hill, so we just squatted down and waited, and these sheep started coming up around us. Well, none of them is a legal ram, but we just sat there for as long as we could, probably 45 minutes, and these sheep would come around us, and they'd look at us, and they'd display their horns until finally we couldn't take it anymore. And you get to a certain age, you can't squat for very long anymore and we finally had to move and they they filed off caribou uh, important moose this uh, uh, this is a shot from the US Fish and Wildlife Service and that's a cow and a calf that I photographed on one of our <coughs> moose hunts they are huge animals and if you're in a trivia contest what's the largest member of the deer family 
It's the moose. They're basically aquatic deer. Mountain goats, uh, especially in the, in the mountains along the coast in southeast Alaska. They live in some pretty steep places, those, uh, those steep rock faces. That's escape habitat for them. They can, they can maneuver on those ledges that, that wolves and bears are not able to. And then marine mammals. This is a, uh, this is a harbor seal on an iceberg off, oh, I think, it's, I think it's in Glacier Bay National Park. But 52 pounds of marine mammals, which is uh, several different species of, of seals and uh, including whales. Uh, I think the villages along the Arctic coast, I think they're allowed 50 to 60 strikes per year on whales. Oh, and I uh, went fishing for king crab one day. They opened the season in Juneau. It was only for a week. And we're fishing ring gear. So one's a red king crab and the other's a, a tanner crab. And that was, uh, that was quite a haul for us. The, the limit for us was two per family. And they aren't like real pots, they're just ring gear. They, they, they lay flat on the bottom. The crabs get on top of them and start eating the bait. And you lift them up and the sides come up and you're pulling them up so fast they can't crawl over the edge. That's me with, I don't know how many hundreds of dollars worth of king crab that is. Sad story, I'm, I have a shellfish allergy. <laughs> but, but my wife doesn't. <laughs> And then shrimp, Dungeness crab, Tanner crab, that's uh, my granddaughter there, she loves to pose. And then birds, 2%. This was a, uh, a spruce grouse uh, found in the northern boreal forest. They are very, uh, I don't want to say dumb. Uh, they're not very alert. They're 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 not very wary. Let's put it that way. They're not very suspicious of anything. And uh, hunting moose. One of the great benefits of hunting is sitting out in the woods and nothing happening except things like this. A spruce grouse landed next to me. This is the male. You can see the red eyebrows. And it it strutted around me. It, it didn't like me being there. And this is what a psychologist would call displaced aggression. He's displaying and then he's ripping apart hunks of grass. And you know, just like a little turkey, well, they're related to turkeys. They're, they're, they're uh, gallinaceous fowl, which are ground feeding, ground nesting. Yep, it's he's ripping at that. Uh, that's right. That's right. Oh gosh, he was he was there for for half a day. A number of females were in a little gravel uh, gravel pit picking gravel uh, near the near the river. Uh, this is a willow ptarmigan, which is Alaska state bird. That's another trivia question. What's Alaska state bird? Well, it's the willow ptarmigan, and that is. The north end of the town of Juneau there. No, that's the south end of the town of Juneau. About uh, 2,000 feet below, maybe 3,000. Plants. Uh, high bush cranberry. This is, gosh, there's a lot of high bush cranberry up there. I, I was just amazed. I loved high bush cranberry jelly as a kid, but it was hard to find places where you could pick enough high bush cranberries. And Alaska is just a, a Somebody, I'd been in Alaska for a year, and somebody who'd been there for quite a while asked me a question, what was the most impressive thing you found about Alaska? And he thought I was going to see bears and glaciers and the fish, but no, it's berries. There are berries all over the place. Uh, berries I'd never heard of. Uh, this is lingonberry. It's, it's very popular in Scandinavian countries, and it's a, a, a boreal forest type of berry. 
they're very much like cranberries, but they grow on, on short bushes rather than right down in the, cran in the bog. Uh, yellow salmon berry, there's red salmon berries, timber berries, I'd never heard of those before, but they grow on the west coast. Uh, red huckleberries. And then, of course, make jam out of, out of a lot of that. So, I've got a story about, uh, oh gosh, it's a, it's a romance, it's a, it's a family story. It's, in 1973, I was a junior at Lake Superior State College in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and I got a job, a summer job, way down in the lower peninsula, down below we called it, because it was down below the bridge, uh, 200 miles away from home. Well, the job wasn't going to pay very much. It was with the U.S. Forest Service, a summer job. And so I decided I'd save money by staying in a Forest Service campground for the summer in a tent. Well, the best thing that happened was there were two other young women who went to the same school I did sharing a tent in the same campground. And so over the course of the summer, Kathy and, and Lori and I became pretty good friends. And in all honesty, I developed some feelings of affection for Kathy. Gosh, she was a, a tall dark-haired beauty. Uh, not that she was ever going to know how I felt because I was a terribly shy and socially awkward young man at the time. Well, Kathy's parents came up to visit. They, uh, they lived in Allen Park, not too far from here, and they came up to visit and Kathy introduced me to her parents. Uh, Bill was uh, about six foot four. He was a pipe fitter by trade and it was very apparent that he had worked hard his whole life. Marge, on the other hand, was only about five foot six, but she had grown up in Pennsylvania coal, Pennsylvania coal country, and she was no less imposing than Bill. And when they learned who I was, Bill stood on one side of me, and Marge stood on the other, and they started firing questions at me. What'd your dad do for a living? Does your mother work, or is she at home? What kind of truck does he drive, Ford or Chevy, <laughs> or Dodge? When are you going to graduate? What kind of a job can you get with a degree in biology? Oh, man, it went on for minutes. I mean, it was an interrogation. And finally, when they left that weekend, I told Kathy, I said, your parents really put me through an interrogation. And she laughed. And she said, it could have been a lot worse. And I said, how could it have been worse? And she said, I didn't tell them that you were my boyfriend. <laughs> I had a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever been a young man, you might remember a time in your life when, when having a girlfriend might have been the most important thing in the world. Well, as, as luck would have it, Kathy and I were married three years later. Oh. And we lived right there in that same town where we had met in the campground. And Bill and Marge would come up to visit their oldest daughter. And I never knew how or even if I fit in with that family, even after the grandchildren were born. But Bill and Marge would come up to visit Kathy and the kids. And we moved to Minnesota. And Bill and Marge would come to visit us there. And on the first trip to Minnesota, Marge says to me, I see you've got a new boat in the driveway. What do you do with it? Well, Marge, the the walleye fishing here in Minnesota is just fantastic. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, uh, I've never had walleye fishing this good. And she looked at me and she said, you know, walleyes are my favorite fish, both to catch and to eat. Let's go fishing. So the very next morning, Marge and I went fishing. And we did all right out on Leech Lake on the Chippewa National Forest. Boy, we might even limit it out. And we cleaned them, we cooked them, oh man, that was great. We went out the next morning for walleyes. Did okay there. And then the third morning, we start out in the boat and we're getting ready to, to bait up our hooks and start fishing for walleyes. And she gives me a long, apprising look. And she says, you know, my sister Ann and I used to fish together all the time in Montana before she passed away. And we had this running bet. 25 cents for the first fish, 25 cents for the most fish, 25 cents for the biggest fish. 
would you be interested in taking me up on that? <laughs> well, here was an opportunity for me to win 75 cents from my mother-in-law every time I took her out fishing. So I said, sure. And so we started fishing, and a couple of minutes later, I got a fish. Hey, Marge, I got the first fish. And she looked at it, and she says, that's a perch. We're fishing for walleyes. <laughs> perch don't count. Oh, oh, Marge, I got the first walleye. And she looked at it, and she says, that is 10 inches long. We don't keep them that small. That doesn't count. Now, apparently, there were a whole bunch of rules in this fishing game that I was not entirely aware of. Well, we were out fishing one day. About 10 o'clock in the morning, Marge has six walleyes. I've got three. And about 10 o'clock in the morning, she starts to fidget. And, and she starts to squirm in her boat seat. And, and finally, she says, uh, look, I saw a restroom up there at the boat landing. We're going to have to go in. But the fish are still biting. We have to go in right now. Okay, so we pulled up our gear, got it in the boat. Luckily, the boat landing was only five minutes away, so I pulled in to the little harbor and next to the little dock, and before we'd even bumped the dock, Marge was up out of the bow of that boat like a cat onto the dock, and she made a beeline. I'd never seen her move that fast toward the restroom up there in the parking lot. Well, the boat is still rocking, and so I grabbed a hold of the dock, and I'm getting ready to secure it with some lines, and I looked up at the parking lot, and she's standing there in the middle of the parking lot talking to a stranger. And then she hurries on to the restroom. And so I finished tying up the boat, and I'm straightening things out, and this guy she was talking to kind of saunters down out on the boat, and he looks down or out on the dock, and he looks down at me and says, so the word around the campground is that your mother-in-law outfished you this morning. Marge took her fishing seriously. There was nothing going to stop her from making a break for the restroom except an opportunity to tell a complete stranger that she'd outfished her son-in-law. <laughs> Eventually, Kathy and I moved to Ketchikan and the grandkids. Bill and Marge came to visit us. The first trip, Marge says, I hear the fishing's pretty good in Alaska. <laughs> What's biting now? Oh, Marge, the king salmon are in. Man, they are the, some of the best eating fish. You can, you can roast them, you can bake them, you can grill them. Smoked king salmon might be the best salmon you have ever eaten. And they grow to 20, 25 pounds. And Marge looked at me and she said, let's go fishing. <laughs> so the very next morning, Marge and I go out fishing for king salmon. But fishing for king salmon is not like fishing for walleyes. No, it takes an average of 35 hours of fishing for every king salmon that's caught. And that's when they're biting. So I didn't have high hopes, but you know that first hour we trolled back and forth, trolled back and forth, not a bite. After two hours, we were pretty much out of topics of conversation. After three hours, I ran out of coffee. And after four hours, I was about out of patience. And I'm about to tell Marge, you know, maybe we just ought to pack up, call it good for the day, go in and have lunch and try again tomorrow morning. But before I could get those words out of my mouth, Marge's fishing rod bends over double and lines start screaming out, zzz, 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 zzz. holy smokes, Marge, you got a fish. Set the hook, so she picks up her rod or the rod holder, and she gave it a tug, and that fish felt those hooks, and it really took off. And Marge, is, it's a level wind reel, and Marge is reeling, and the line is still going out. No, 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 Marge, you've got to put your thumb on the reel and stop that fish from running, and then you bring it back toward you, and then you reel the rod tip down, and you pull it back toward you, and then you reel it down. And she started doing that, and she'd bring that fish in 15 or 20 feet, and the fish would run 30 feet. You know, zzz, zzz, and she'd stop, and she'd bring it back. She'd bring it in 30 feet, and the, and the fish would run 20 feet back and forth, back for 30 minutes of this. And finally, she, she gets that, that fish close to the boat, maybe 10 feet away, and that fish eyeballs us. And it took off on a run. 
I mean, this is 50, uh, this is 75, this is 100, 150 feet that fish is going and, and Marge can't stop him. And finally the, the line goes slack. And, and she looks at me and she said, it's gone. Well, I looked out in the, in the general direction of the last known location of that fish and it looked like a scene from Jaws. It's, there was a wave in front of its nose and its dorsal fin is sticking out of the water and said, no Marge, he's heading for the boat, you gotta reel as fast as you can. So she started reeling as fast as she can, trying to catch up with all that, that, that slack line and finally, finally she, she tightened it up and that fish was close to the boat and it dove, it went down 200 feet all the way to the bottom and she can't stop it. And finally she starts hoisting it out, you know, reeling it. Oh, hoisting it out, reeling, hoisting it up. And finally that fish is about six feet from the side of the boat and it's laying on its side and its gills are just slowly working like that. And I looked and I could see just one hook in the corner of its jaw like that. And I knew if that fish made another run, it was going to be gone. So I said, Marge, you got to hold your rod up and bring that fish in closer to the boat so I can net him. And I looked at her and she was so tired, she couldn't raise her hands above her waist. Well, what am I gonna do? I thought, well, maybe I could grab that line and pull that fish in closer to the boat. But one of the things that I had learned about fishing with Marge over the years was that you do not touch her fishing line. Well, well you know, what could I do? So I, so I grabbed the landing net by the very end of the handle and I, I hooked my heels under the seat of the boat so I wouldn't fall overboard, and I lunged over the gunnels and landed on my ribs. Oh, did that hurt, but I got that net just under the fish, and I pulled it in hand over hand until it was right next to the boat, and I gathered that net over top of that fish, and I hoisted it up out of the water, and I dropped it between us on the floorboards, and, and we stood there just looking at it. 37 pounds of ice cold, quivering wild Alaska king salmon. Well, I stepped over the fish because I was going to give her the Minnesota fishing guide. Nice fish, good job, handshake. Well, she sat down her fishing rod, put a hand on each of my shoulders, stood on her tippy toes, and she gave me a kiss right on the lips. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> I was in with that family. <laughs> now, that pretty much sealed our relationship. And over the years, Marge and I would fish together every chance that we got. We'd fish for kings, salmon, cohos. We'd fish for halibut. We'd go out crabbing. We'd watch the whales feeding on, on herring over here. And, Watch the, the Alaska brown bears with cubs walking the shoreline on Admiralty Island. And that, that continued until Bill got sick one year. And our fishing trips came to a halt for a couple of years until Bill passed away. And Marge decided that she was going to come back to Alaska on her own. And we took up fishing just the way we had before for kings and silvers. And when her hips got so bad, she couldn't walk down the ramp to the to the boat, boat uh, floats. Uh, we rented a wheelchair and wheel her down to the boat in the morning and wheel her up the ramp at the end of the day. And you know, we must have been quite a sight with this wheelchair lashed to the top of the boat, fishing out in our favorite spots. But eventually, as going to happen to many of us, we're not going to be able to travel anymore. And Marge couldn't. And oh gosh, she passed away 10 years ago. And for the life of me, I can't remember the last king salmon she ever caught but I'll never forget her first. <laughs> and that's, that's Marge and Bill with her 37 pound king salmon. So living off the land, it's tradition, it's culture, and I think most importantly it's family. This program was recorded on May 6th, 2019.
at the Ann Arbor District Library.